I want to ask you a question this morning. When it comes to sharing your faith, what are you waiting for? Maybe you want to read another book about it or hear another sermon about it or attend another class about it. But for some reason, we are all a little reluctant when it comes to sharing our faith. In his book, How to Share Your Faith, Greg Laurie, the California pastor, author, and evangelist from Southern California, talks about when he first came to Christ back in the late 60s. He was about 17 or 18 years old, a teenager in high school. And the church that he attended, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, had evangelism woven into the DNA of their church. People loved to witness and share their faith, and they were seeing a lot of people come to Christ during those days. And Greg Laurie wanted to share his faith, and he'd never done it before. He'd seen other people doing it, but he decided he would go down to the beach one day and share his faith. Well, he was very reluctant. He didn't think he knew what he was doing. He had only been a Christian for a few months, but he went down to the beach, and he started looking around. He saw a lady there that was about the age of his mom, and he thought, you know, she's my mom's age. Maybe she'll be a little more sympathetic, a little more, take a little more pity on me. He was just a teenager at the time. So he went up to her, and he was awkward. He didn't really know what to say, and he asked her if he could talk to her about Jesus, and Surprisingly, she said yes, and so they sat down. And the whole time he was thinking to himself, man, I'm doing terrible. This is not working. I shouldn't even be here. She's never going to believe anything I have to say. He reached in his jeans, pulled out a little booklet with the gospel story written in it, and he just started reading that booklet verbatim. Didn't really know what to say. And she was listening, and the whole time he was thinking, this is not going to work. When he came down to the end, he read in the booklet, is there any reason why you wouldn't be willing to receive Jesus right now? And to his surprise, the lady said, no, there's no reason why I wouldn't. And he looked at her and he said, so you're saying you would like to accept Jesus as your savior? And she said, yes, I would. So he fumbled through the booklet for a prayer and he found the prayer and he led the lady in prayer. And after she had prayed, the lady looked up and said, something just happened to me. And in his book, Greg Laurie says, and I quote, at that moment, something happened to me too. I got a taste of what it was like to be used by God. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have different gifts, different skills. We're at different places in the Christian life. But I'm absolutely certain of this based upon the teaching of Scripture. God wants to use you to reach other people for Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want us to look at the subject, loving the lost. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we're going to look at verse 1. While you're turning there, let me remind you, you've already seen announcements about it. Uh, two things. Number one, next week is the big Austin Marathon. Now, we just had the 3M Marathon. Next week's the big Austin Marathon. And so we'll be giving you information about that this week, making sure you know the best way to get to church. There will be a way. They've been working with us more and more each year. We appreciate that. It's good for the city, but we want them to work with us. And they've been very helpful in the last couple of years designing routes that don't just shut us down on Sunday morning. So we appreciate that. And we'll be giving you that information. And uh, last time we had the marathon, the 3M marathon, y'all did a great job. We're able to make it. So we hope that next week you'll also, the 16th of February, right? The following week. Okay, good. So we got, good, two weeks. Amen. Hey, up here, I'm already there, Okay. So uh, that's the 16th. But tonight, for sure tonight, we're having a big fellowship. Now, I don't know what the law is, but something about calling a party a Super Bowl party is against the rules. And so I want you to know that this big party that we're having during the Super Bowl to watch the Super Bowl is not a Super Bowl party under any circumstances. Let that go out over the airwaves. This is not, I repeat, a Super Bowl party. We're going to be there during the Super Bowl with the big screen watching the Super Bowl, but it's against the law to call it a Super Bowl party. So 
come to the Big Game Fellowship and watch the Super Bowl tonight with your church at 5.30 at the quarries. Now, if you want to come out for a time of exciting, dynamic worship from 5 to 5.30, the Quarries Church will be having an abbreviated service. The best part, the music and the praying. Come on out at 5 for that, and then at 5.30, we'll be over at the CLC to watch the Super Bowl, but do not call it a Super Bowl party. Invite anybody you want. We'd love for everybody to come. Don't mention that it's a Super Bowl party under any circumstances. Okay, we got that right. All right, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two, 36 teams, ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. In other words, the Lord had a big ministry uh, vision, big agenda, and he got all these guys together and he sent them out in pre-evangelism teams like workers and he told them verse 2 the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few so there's the problem the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into his harvest field my buddy in Atlanta, James Merritt, said recently, and I quote, we need God's army of soldiers to get out of the barracks and onto the battlefield to bring men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus talks about a harvest, he's not talking about farming. He's using farming as an analogy or as an illustration for something spiritual about spiritual harvest, about men and women, boys and girls coming to faith in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, this wasn't the first time or the only time that he had used this analogy. Over in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, in a totally different context, the Bible says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, he sensed their spiritual needs and he saw that there was no spiritual guidance for them. And he saw them like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. In other words, there's plenty of opportunity to do ministry, but there's not enough ministers. And then over in John chapter 4, verse 35, remember the longest conversation that Jesus ever had with anybody in the New Testament was when he talked to the woman at the well in the town called Sychar. We call it Nabalus today in the West Bank. It was Yasser Arafat's headquarters while he was the head of the Palestine Liberation or, or, uh, Organization organization. And so Jesus is there in Nablus or Sychar as it was called in those days. It's high noon and Jesus has been walking up from Jerusalem. It's a long walk. He'd been walking for hours. He had sent his disciples into the little town of Sychar, a quarter of a mile away from the well. He sat down at the well and he's sitting there in the blazing hot sun. A woman walks up and Jesus says, give me a drink. He engages her in a conversation which leads to a realization that he has living water to give. She comes to the realization that she's talking to the Messiah. The Bible says she drops her bucket, runs back into town, and tells the whole town, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And apparently the whole town comes with her or everybody she talked to starts coming with her. Meanwhile, back at the well, the disciples have come up now and they've got like, they've been to, uh, you know, uh, Taco Bell or whatever, and they've got like some burritos, some tacos or fish and chips, whatever they were gonna eat that day. Happy meals. And uh, Jesus doesn't want to eat all of a sudden. He said, I have meat to eat you know not of. And they think that he's already gotten food somewhere else. And then Jesus made this statement. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look on the fields. They are ripe unto harvest. And about that time, they must have looked up and here came a whole town of people that need to be saved. When Jesus talked about a harvest, he used the word harvest as a synonym for very highly effective evangelistic results of people coming to faith in Christ to be saved. Now, when we started this series, this is our fifth message in the series, strategic, successful strategies for spiritual growth, Remember I said that 
Successful spiritual growth is like marriage in this way. Couple gets married, first thing they do, move in together, set up housekeeping, and let the world know we're a team. When you get saved, same thing. You move into the Lord's house, you become a part of the church. Number two, when you're married, you talk to your spouse. We said same thing. When you're walking with Jesus, you talk to him. That's prayer. Number three, when you're married, you listen to the dreams and the heart and the fears and the ambitions of your spouse. Spouse, You listen. So not only do you talk, you listen. That's like in the Christian life, studying the word where God speaks to us. And number four, we said, doesn't always happen, but most of the time, in the vast majority of cases, couples become parents before long, either through adoption or uh, biological reproduction. We're wired to reproduce, we're built to reproduce, and eventually most couples, not all, but most couples worldwide, down through history from Adam and even on down to us, become parents parents. And in the Christian life, we're to become spiritual parents. We're to lead others to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, here's something I want you to think about. All these things are very important in the Christian life. But brothers and sisters, if the Christian life was just about going to church, in other words, we come here, we worship the Lord, we open the Word of God, we study together, we fellowship with one another, we encourage one another. If that's what the Christian life was all about, how many of you know I'm going to do that in heaven a lot better than I'm doing it here? I mean, when I get to heaven, my worship is going to be full time. And I'm not going to need to encourage anybody because everybody's going to be in the presence of Jesus. And nobody's going to have to hold me accountable to do a better job in the Christian life because I'm going to be in heaven. And if, if going to church is the, you know, the sum total of what it means to be a Christian, then I should have died the day I got saved and gone straight to heaven because I can be in church right now in the presence of God, in a better church than I'm in now. I love our church. Best church for me in the world is right here, right now, until I get to heaven. And that's ultimate, right there. And I believe in prayer. Amen? But I'm telling you, when I get to heaven, I won't have any prayer times like I have now. Like, oh God, I want to thank you for this day. Man, what a day. Raining again, cold. What's the deal with the weather, Lord? Oh, wait a minute, I'm praying. And Lord, I want to thank you for my family. Oh, yeah, I got to make a doctor's appointment. Oh, never mind. And Lord, I want to thank you for the way you've blessed my church. Oh, my goodness, I got appointments this week. It's going to kill me. So my prayer life is often distracted by the things of this world. But when I get to heaven, man, I'm going to be talking to Jesus face to face. No distractions. So if prayer is what the... See? See what I'm saying? You get it. You're there ahead of me. If prayer is what the Christian life is all about, if that's really what the Christian life is all about, then I should have died when I got saved and I could be talking to Jesus face to face right now with no distractions. You say, well, what about, the, what about Bible study? You said that's essential. It's essential. It's critical to your Christian growth. If you don't study the Bible, you need mega doses of Scripture in this world we live in. And if you're not reading Scripture on a regular basis, then you're not growing like you should. But ladies and gentlemen, when I get to heaven, I won't need the Bible because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that when we get there, I will know even as I am known. And just as much as God knows, I'm going to know. All the mysteries are going to be real. Everything I'm trying to learn about God, I'll already know when I get to heaven because my mind will be expanded and I will be part of, the, uh, of, of God's family in such a way that there will be no mysteries left. Everything will be real. I won't need to study the Bible. So if studying the Bible is what the Christian life is all about, then brothers and sisters, I should have died the minute I got saved because I could be up there in the presence of God and I would know everything now. Of the spiritual disciplines of going to church, reading the Bible, praying, and winning souls, there's only one thing I'm not going to do in heaven. I'm not going to win anybody to Christ in heaven. That's a right now activity. That is a right now activity. Brothers and sisters, when you get to heaven, you won't need to win anybody to Christ because everybody in heaven's already saved. And if anybody isn't in heaven that needs to get saved, it's too late for them to be saved. 
Now, I one time told a friend of mine, I said, look, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord. I know a lot of people are going to want appointments with Jesus, and I'm going to ask the Lord if he'll give me the job of escorting people into the presence of the Lord because I really like bringing people into Jesus, into his presence. And my buddy said, hey, when I get to heaven, I don't need you to take me to Jesus. I'll get get to Jesus on my own without your help. So see, I won't even have a job in heaven. I'll be out of work. I'll be unemployed (laughs) in heaven. I'm joining the choir when I get to heaven, amen? (laughs) Amen. Nobody here has asked me to join a choir. (laughs) I'm not waiting for an invitation when I get to heaven. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, when it comes to evangelism, ladies and gentlemen, that is a right now activity. That is something you and I... That is a part of the Christian life that if you don't do it now, you will never have the opportunity to do it. And if you do not win people, if you are not witnessing to people, if you're not sharing your faith, if you're not trying to work with others to somehow advance the cause of Jesus Christ, you will never grow to the fullness that God wants you to grow in the Christian life. So there's one simple principle that I want us to notice this morning, and then we're just going to look at it for a few minutes. I want us to notice that Jesus calls us to intercede for an in-gathering. Jesus calls us to intercede for an in-gathering. Look at verse 2. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. A friend of mine and an evangelist in Atlanta, Bailey Smith, once said, and I quote, the task before us demands an all-out effort in at least two areas, the reaching of the lost and the motivation of Christians to be consistent soul winners, end of quote. Now, there are different gifts There are different callings, but ladies and gentlemen, we must all be working toward one objective, seeing people come to Christ. Because as I I mentioned a moment ago, everything else in the Christian life, you'll do better than you are doing it now when you get to heaven. Therefore, it appears to me that the one reason Jesus left us here was that we could reach other people for Christ. He didn't leave me here so I could be a better Christian. I can be a better Christian in heaven. He left me here, and I want to be a better Christian, amen? But Jesus left me here, not for my sake, but so that I might be able to reach more people for Christ before that great day when nobody else can work. So how are we going to do it? Well, Jesus gave us the instructions right here, and I want us to notice a few things very quickly. First of all, we have a promise. Look at verse 2. The harvest is plentiful. Isn't that a good word? The harvest is plentiful. In other words, brothers and sisters, Jesus promises a great harvest. In other words, Jesus promises lots of people are still coming to Christ. It's not over. More people are going to be saved. Lots more people are going to be saved because Jesus promised a plentiful harvest. And that word plentiful means abundant, great harvest. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, here's Jesus, a 30-year-old single man without a job, a few ragtag followers uh, who people had their questions about their uh, integrity. You had a tax collector. You had a a uh, political zealot. You had some guys who spent their lives fishing, smelled a little fishy all the time. And uh, he had no money and uh, no political clout whatsoever. And the religious leaders had already dismissed him. And one day he looked at his boys and he said, I promise you there is coming a great harvest. If Jesus wasn't who he said he is, that would have been the most fantastic, outrageous claim that anybody has ever made. 
It is only 2,000 years later that we're able to evaluate the veracity of that promise. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't believe the Bible, can you at least believe that piece right there? That Jesus of Nazareth, an out-of-work carpenter with no rabbinical training and no political clout and no financial department said the harvest is plentiful. And I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. It took 1,900 years, but the 20th century. You say, Pastor, we're in the 21st century. I know. Stay with me. The 20th century, lean in your close because this is huge, was the tipping point. Something happened in the 20th century. You say, what are you talking about? Listen, in 1910, you say, well, it was before my time. It was like your parents' and grandparents' time. In fact, we had a man, Edgar Redford, who was always coming to church here, and, you know, we sang happy birthday to him. Last year, he turned 103. He died a couple weeks ago, went to heaven. I believe he was born in 1910, but he was like 104 now, so... We're talking a long while back, but most of us don't remember 1910. In 1910, the beginning of the 20th century, my grandfather was 12 years old. In 1910, 93% of all Christians in the world were in Europe or the United States. By 2010, 13% of Christians were in the Asian Pacific, and 26% of Christians are in Sub-Saharan Africa. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, in one century, after 19 centuries of a consolidation of Christianity in Europe, after 19 centuries, in the 20th century, Christianity finally broke out of its European confines and became, for the first time since Jesus walked the earth, a global movement. Stay with me. That means, according to Pew Research Center, that Christianity is so spread out today and is so strong in so many different places that literally no continent can claim to be the global center of Christianity any longer. Uh, up till the 20th century, Europe and the United States could claim to be the center of Christianity. But today, listen, the global center of Christianity is the whole whole wide world. And brothers and sisters, I want you to understand what all that means. Today, in 2014, I just read this this very week, the information just came out. There are more, are you with me? There are more Christians in communist red China than there are in the United States of America. Today, by conservative estimates... By conservative esti estimates of missiologists and sociologists, there are 159 million Protestant born-again Christians in communist red China, the vast majority of them living in secret house churches. As a matter of fact, child of God, there are more Christians in China than there are communists in China. There was a tipping point, and we've lived through that time. The gospel of Jesus has spread all over the world. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said this gospel will be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. He's gathering his sheep. He's sending us out and we're reaching the world as never before in our lifetimes. Jesus made a promise. He said the harvest is plentiful. But then I want you to see something else. There's a problem. He said the workers are few. Couldn't see a contrast any more obvious than that. The harvest is plentiful. The workers, the laborers, are few. I love what Amy Carmichael once said. We have all eternity to celebrate our victories, but only one brief moment before twilight to win them. In other words, brothers and sisters, we have got some work to do. And I was looking at this passage of Scripture, and uh, notice what it says. The laborers are few. 
And I've often wondered, why are we so reluctant to get into evangelism? Why are we so ready to pray and read the Bible and go to church and uh, go to conferences? But why are we so reluctant on it when it comes to evangelism? And then just this week, 35 years of studying this, it dawned on me. Look at the word, laborers. Oh, could this be the reason? Labor means work. Is that what it is? I mean, somebody says most of us are willing to serve God, but usually in a supervisor's capacity. But here's what Jesus said. I don't need any more CEOs. I don't need any COOs. I don't need any more CFOs. I need some laborers, some farmhands, some migrant workers, some crop sharers. I need some men and women with a bandana around their forehead, perspiration pouring down their face, their hands filled with calluses because they're out in the fields working for the Lord. Have you ever noticed that when you're doing what you like, it doesn't seem too bad? You can do it for hours. And no matter how strenuous it is, no matter how... You, it doesn't bother you because you're, love, you're loving it. Uh, I had to go to Walmart, and uh, I, Tina needed, uh, uh, in her car, her car needed uh, that windshield wiper fluid. So I went to Walmart to get a gallon of windshield wiper fluid. Well, I was raised in the automobile business. I've loved cars all my life, and I love the automotive section I like auto shops and auto, you know, all that. I don't know much about any of it, but I like it all. I'm fascinated with it. And, you know, I could just walk around. So I'm over at the automotive area at Walmart. They got a big one over there. It's a superstore, you know. So I'm wandering around the automotive section, and everything in there, I'm thinking, you know, I need that. I bet that would be good to have. And I even got a text from Tina saying, what's taking you so long? I just need a gallon of, you know, the fluid. And... Uh, and so I'm walking through the automotive section, and something caught my eye. It was a black bottle, a spray bottle, in the car wash and wax section. And it said it had polymer in it. You had me at polymer. <laughs> and I picked that up. I started looking at it. Now, I have a black car, okay? Tina has a black car. Laura has a black car. Joseph has a black car. Amanda has a red car. I don't know. She's left-handed. You know, I don't know. She does stuff different. <laughs> but all the rest of us, by choice, have a black car. So I, I love black cars. And if I were to get a new car, which I have no plans of doing so, but if I were to get a new car, car, I'm pretty sure I'd get a black car. I like black cars. I don't care what you like. That's fine with you. But I like black cars. So I'm walking along, and I see this thing with polymer in it, and here's what it said makes black cars blacker. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> now, my car is six years old, and it looks pretty good, but it could look better. And so I got this, and I was reading about it, makes black cars blacker. And all you had to do was mist it on and then buff it off. And I'm thinking, you know what? That would really make my car look good. But then it was like eight bucks. And I'm like, eh, you know, I came for a gallon of windshield wiper fluid. So I put it back and I walked like three feet and I thought, but Tina has a black car and that would only be $4 a piece. <laughs> so I got it. I couldn't wait to get home. Couldn't wait to get home to buff my car down. And uh, so I'm bringing stuff in there and Tina's like, what is this? And I said, honey, it makes black cars blacker. And so I didn't have time to do it right then, and I got tied up, and, and then it started getting dark outside. So I'm out there in the dark now in my neighborhood. My car's in my driveway, and I get this picture. I'm out there in my, in, in my neighborhood in the dark, and I'm spritzing this stuff off, and I'm buffing it down, but I can't really see the awesome job because it's dark outside. And so I'm out there, and I'm buffing and shining, you know, and one of my neighbors walks by, he's walking his dog, and he's being neighborly, and he goes, he goes, uh, hey, it looks really shiny. And I said, I got some stuff 
that makes a black car blacker. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. Joseph comes home later. He's getting some stuff. I'm helping him load some stuff in his car. And I said, hey, Joseph, do me a favor. When you pull out, pull up on my car, shine your lights, turn your high beams on. He goes, why? I said, because I got some stuff today that makes a black car blacker. He goes, it is looking good. And he shined his lights on there. And I shouldn't tell you this, but I've told everybody else today, so I'm going to tell you. When he shined his lights up there, I saw a little spot that looked a little waxy because I was doing it in the dark earlier, right? And I was wearing like a Longhorn t-shirt, but it was dark out. People, I took my t-shirt off and I was buffing the side of my car down. Now, if you can get that mental picture out of your mind, I want you to understand I was obsessed about getting my black car blacker. <laughs> and it occurred to me that when you love what you're doing, you will go to extremes to get it done. I wouldn't take my shirt off in my neighborhood If they were giving away free money on the 4th of July, I wouldn't do that. But in that moment, I thought that's the only thing I can do. I don't want to run back in the house because he's here with that shine. I'm going to do it right now. When my neighbor walked by, I'm telling him, hey, I got some stuff to make a black car blacker. I tell Joseph, got some stuff that will make a black car blacker. Tell Tina, got some stuff that will make a black car blacker. When you're excited about something, you don't wait for somebody else to bring it up. You can't wait to talk about it. If it costs you a little extra, you'll pay it because you want it so bad. Ladies and gentlemen, here's my question. I'm not asking you if I can come by your house later and work on your car. <laughs> Although I probably would do it if you got a black car. I'd like to show you what I can do. <laughs> But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm just raising this question with you. When's the last time you got so excited about what Jesus has done in your life that you didn't wait for somebody else to bring it up? You're just talking about what the Lord has done in you. And you didn't ask, what's it going to cost me? And you didn't ask, what's going to be the exertion or the effort that I'm going to have put forth? But you're just willing to tell everybody, I got a thing that'll make a black car blacker. Brothers and sisters, the problem was real simple. Jesus needs more people who are willing to pay the price, take off their shirt in the middle of the night if necessary, and rub their car down, and tell everybody they know about something they've discovered. Jesus needs more of us willing to just talk about him. One final thing, and this is just for a second. I want you to see the plan. There's a promise, big harvest. There's a problem, not enough workers. Look at the plan. Look at it. The, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Now, let me just have a little hallelujah fit. 35 years I've been preaching this gospel. Why I never noticed this before, I don't know. But at the 8.30 service when I was reading this, I'm like, woo! <laughs> we serve the Lord of the harvest. I'm ready to join his team. He's not the Lord of the seed planting. He's not the Lord of fertilizer. He's not the Lord of disking. He's not the Lord of plowing. He's not the Lord of watering. He's the Lord of harvest. But now look, what he look at his plan. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest. That word ask is the word pray. That's why the King James, the King James says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. Does it ever seem to you like all of God's solutions are the same to every problem? Pray about it and do something about it. That's pretty much God's answer to everything. Amen? 
Pray about it and do something about it. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into the field. I love what Dawson Trotman once told the navigators. When you pray, believe the impossible. When you pray, believe the impossible. How many of you believe we could run 10,000 in worship someday? Amen. When you pray, believe. When you pray, ask the Lord of the just barely getting by to help you. No. When you pray, ask the Lord that's flat broke already to help you. No. When you pray, ask the Lord of the harvest to come on in and do what only he can do. And look what he said. To send forth laborers into the harvest. My grandfather wasn't a Christian, and I used to pray, oh, God, send somebody a witness to my grandfather. Send somebody a witness to my grandfather. Oh, Lord, put somebody in his path. One day the Lord spoke to me and said, hey, dummy, <laughs> you're the preacher in the family. Who do you think I ought to send? So I was over in St. Louis. I rented a car, drove all the way over to southern Illinois where my grandfather was. When he got up after lunch to go out to his, uh, out to his shed, he had, a, he had a farm. He went out, out there, I was following him out, and he was just working on one of the front tractors of his tire. And he was kneeling down there, and I knelt down beside him and, and started talking to him about the Lord. And, and that day I led my grandfather to pray to receive Christ. And a few years later, I preached his funeral and was able to tell the whole family about the day that granddad accepted Jesus as his Savior. We knew he was in heaven as a result. Ladies and gentlemen, I kept saying, Lord, send somebody, send somebody, send somebody. And I'm going to tell you something. When you pray that God will send somebody, God will often send you. You remember Isaiah chapter 6? Isaiah saw the Lord high, holy, and lifted up. And he heard the Lord say, whom shall I send and who will go for us? I'm thankful today that Isaiah didn't say, good luck with that. What did he say? Send me. What we need today are some men and women, some boys and girls, some members of our fellowship who will hear the Lord of the harvest saying, whom will I send? Who will go? We need some people to say, Lord, send me.